Good morning. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And today we're talking about something. I believe it was called optimization or non optimization. Suboptimal play. Suboptimal play. Or suboptimal character creation. And if you don't know what that is, I'm right there with you. <laughs> we're going to tell you about it. A lot of times when you play D&D and stuff, a lot of people want to, uh, what is it? They want to build or make their character as best as they can and make them as strong as they can. Some people will view this as a negative because a lot of people who play this way, mainly they're concerned with combat. How good or how fast can you kill something else? In gory, spectacular detail, right? Well, you know, when you're playing a game with teenage boys, this is a... I, I just thought it was teenage boys at first, but I sat down at... Uh, organized play table and Saul was playing a with adults with adults yes, yes. <laughs> and my son and my son always likes to mini max things because you know but he, he grew was up. real young too back then too. yeah he wasn't that young he was like 12 yeah 11 so he'd been playing for a good three or four years at least yeah pathfinder <clears throat> so he he knew about mini maxing and but they the boys really liked that idea that you can because it gives you these by by making your character as maximal as possible as i don't know if maximal is a word maximal but, well it is now i guess by 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 creating a character or building a character as they say the idea for augustine and alan a lot of times was how strong can they be if i play a barbarian what does it give me how can i how can i work to be the best barbarian when right. it comes to a fight and stuff how best can i crush my foes but they're boys, right? They're young boys, and that's like the the most exciting part is the fighting. That was then, right? When they were young. Yeah. Now they're a little bit more into the role playing. Not a whole lot, no, but a little a bit lot. more. Little but bit more. but you can see because recently we were in a game with uh, our friend Jim, and he thought that Augustine would would go after people and fight them. But Augustine, we were playing Shadowrun, and Augustine knew that his that how deadly the system is. And even though he's a big giant brute troll, he wouldn't take the bait and throw a punch at any of them because he knew what would happen. So he talked his way out of it, yes. which was amazing, right? Because right. instead of being the so obviously he's grown. It, it surprised our GM, our Jim, and he said, "I really thought he would, you know, start a fight with these guys because they were being kind of mocking toward him and stuff." But I go, "So why didn't you attack him? I mean, because you would have definitely." He would have definitely probably lived. And he goes, yeah, I would have lived, but the, the rest of you guys would probably died. Especially me, because I'm kind of squishy, because I play a te Technomancer, and my body is like really low, which I might have to change that. But anyway, he he thought about the rest of the party instead of just getting into a fight, which probably wouldn't have happened if he was 11 or 12. Right. You know, four years ago. There's a possibility he might be a role player sooner or later. So the idea that you're building a character... A lot of people build characters on an idea that they have in their head at that time, right? Which has nothing to do with, with like, say you want to be uh, a fighter. They have this idea. Maybe they want to be a ninja fighter or something like that. <laughs> and they come up with that. They had just watched a ninja movie or something. So they, that's what they want to do. Right. So they might have an idea about a character, but not necessarily mini max it because their idea doesn't doesn't go that way right they want their character to be a certain way or they're playing a they want to play someone like dresden or right yeah they, they, they have a what do you call it they have a a role or, or a character in their mind that they're trying to mimic right and i think a lot of people when they first start playing they do that they pattern their characters after you know i remember i don't know what what, what we were playing but a lot of when indiana jones came out not only were a few games emulating that kind of uh uh, that type of feel, that genre, that pulpy game. But there were a lot of characters wanted to be that Indiana Jones with the fedora hat kind of thing, you know. So a lot of things are influenced what kind of character we want to play. A lot of it has to do with movies, maybe even a book that we read. And I think, uh, I remember years, years ago, this is like pretty close to my first game playing original D&D. &D. My friend Esteban had read this book. And I forget what the name of the character was, but he called him like Summer Leaf or something like that. <laughs> so I always thought it was funny. I go, I, and I, and I didn't know that the character had come, the name had come out of a book that he read. It was like you know, it was, this wasn't the name. It was like Lex 
Summer Bird or something, right? And it was just funny that it was Summer Bird. What is, I mean, it was, that was a weird name. But anyway, so obviously books, movies, TV shows influence us. And we want to play those kind of roles or they inspire us to play that type of role. And, you know, I think it's funny. So along with that, you know, sometimes some characters are not all that. They have flaws, right? I, I can't think of a flaw that Indiana Jones has. Uh, what kind of flaw does he have? I can't think of it right now. Maybe he gets into too much trouble. <laughs> but he's extremely lucky, right? Or unlucky sometimes. I guess he could say unlucky. But suboptimal play, does, that, that's kind of a weird term. Term. But what it, I guess what it means is that you play a character that, is, that has flaws, right? And I think sometimes this can happen by accident. Like even mini maximizers can do this by well, not by accident on purpose. But then the accidental part is when the GM finds out about their flaw, depending on what it is, they can exploit that and you know exploit that, and which causes grief to the mini maximizer because that's not you, what he wants. Because if you put all of your points into strength and uh, dexterity and stuff and you take them out of wisdom and charisma then nobody's going to want to talk to you and you're you maybe get held a lot by you're susceptible spell. to certain spells yeah. yes so i think that that is interesting and probably a, a product of that is a secondary product of a person who's mini maximizing and doesn't and thinks they can kind of get away with it right I think that a lot of that could be curtailed in a way oh, yeah. if the GM and a lot of GMs do want to see your character. Some GMs like Saul just say, make a character and I'll look at it, but then they don't actually look at it until you're like, you know, six months into the game and he, and go, he goes, well, now why can you do that again? Let me see your character sheet. It's exactly what happened with, with a couple of my characters, right? I'm like, cause you know, I'm, you know, I'm playing, I'm running Pathfinder or we're playing Pathfinder and, and I understand the progression of how many, what you get for every level. And I actually started with the point by system because I, I basically didn't trust them to roll their dice because all of a sudden these guys have 18s and 18s. Five 18s. And, well, four 18s and one seven, right? So I, I, did a, we did, I did away with that by doing the point by system. And with the point by system, I go, you know, I've noticed one character had like a, almost 20, 20 and something, right? How the hell do you have that high level? In that st- and that's that, and I don't understand. And he goes, well, and then, and, and then I go, how did you have such a high, high, you know? I think it was probably strength. And he, and then I'm like, and then I look at his character. He had like a seven wisdom or something like that, right? And I'm like seven, because that's like a minus two or something to all your rolls. And I'm like, I, you know, I've mentioned this before, and I was just surprised, you know? I, I'm like. You know, one thing is I, I basically trusted my players to, to make good characters, right? They were also young, and their dad didn't uh, They use... were very impressionable. Well, and then, yeah, that, that and that's kind of bugged me even a little bit more because this this was done with the supervision of, of their father, right? And their father is he's an adult. And I'm like, I go, you knew about this? He goes, yeah. Uh, you know, and then I, I forget what he said exactly. I don't know if he read it somewhere that it was a good idea or whatever. And he I'm did. Like, he read it somewhere. He read it somewhere about and dump stats. Yes, dump stats. That's what the term was. And I'm like, I'm like, you know what? I go, I go. I don't think that's good. I don't think that's right. You know, I just thought it was just not, you know, to to specific. And then and then the, the the other brother had done the same thing with his charisma, I think, in the yes. same character. And he was a druid, I think. Yes. And so you know, he figured, oh, a druid doesn't have to talk to people. But for some reason, he every time we they went to town or. We're in a social situation. He wanted to be the leader of the group. And I'm like, well, you're like the least person that, you know, you just come across wrong with your seven charisma and you get your, or whatever it was, eight, it might've been eight, you know, with your minus two to your roles. And then, and then what happened was I, as a bad DM, I guess, I exploited those problems that they had, their characters had, you know, when you have such a low wisdom, you throw a whole person spell on them. And you cannot make that you cannot make that wisdom save wisdom save because the wisdom save is let's say it's fifteen you get no pluses in fact you get negatives right so now you have to roll seventeen or higher on twice I die and frustration for ten because whole person is a really frustrating spell so instead of trying to make your players cry because they did this right. I think it's important that as a GM you sit down with them before or you look at their character sheet before the game starts and you go okay. 
I see what you're trying to do here, but I think your character needs to be a little more rounded. You can't. And and a lot of people are going to take offense to that, right? Because they worked to get this character a certain way. They might. So, so they were going to want you to, to go, you know, well, I want to have 18 in this stat. Well, okay, but then put a couple of your stats down a couple of points and have 10. 10 should be the minimum in anything, right? That's a, a flat one, right? Well, that's what you're most... I mean, unless you're willing to role play that that low number mm. or know that the consequences of that having such a low number and you know but it's something that like i said you as a player and as a gm when you have that conversation say well you know this is going to be the effect in the game and and just know that and so if they're willing to accept that then go ahead but but when but when they're frustrated because they're being held by a whole person spell and can't do anything, and you're the tank, and you're the man, you're the one of the characters that does the most damage. Then, in a fight, being held, you're gonna be useless, right? It worked like a charm, you know. The the group uh, had a much difficult time getting in combat when that character was held because, you know, he was a really powerful fighter, but he was taken out of the equation really easily. And and I think slowly but surely that that kind of stuff has gone away. But they still surprise me with these weird uh, dumb stats and stuff. Well, but that's fun for some people, right? Right. I was reading about optimized characters and one, <laughs> optimized I don't character. think you should, I don't think you should say suboptimal because it sounds funny. Yes. Because. How about flawed characters? Flawed is better. If you think about it in books and, and um, movies and stuff, usually heroes have a flaw, right? That's part of. That's part of what they have to overcome. Right. Right. Right, and I think I think you're right. I think, and I think that's part of role playing, right? Is is what what unless you're John Wick, I think. But even John Wick gets his ass kicked in, right? Yeah. So even he, even he gets caught or whatever, and then you got to figure out. So he has that setback for whatever reason, not for whatever reason, because it makes a better story than if he just went through the whole movie, you know, which he does most of the time, just shooting everybody in the head and killing everybody, but. When he gets hurt, when he gets caught, when he gets damaged, you know, every John Wick movie, he gets hurt. And to the point where he may not live, right? Yeah. I'm using air quotes here. And he's able to overcome whatever situation he's in and and win the day. And that's the way a good session should be, right? That's the way a good, uh, any session, not just Dungeons and Dragons, but any role-playing session should be where, you know, you have have to overcome something and sometimes it could be combat but let's say there's a setback in the combat right you know you think you're gonna win and all of a sudden the other team gets the the other other side gets reinforcements or something so you either have to back off or reevaluate what you're gonna do which is a very hard thing for some characters and groups to do to back off i'm guilty of uh making of having uh players uh not ever back down right they don't want to ever run away and and that's part of my problem that I've always had, because I think I told a story where we were chasing this dragon and we did were adamant that we had to get past this dragon or kill it. And then the GM at one point at the very end goes, "Was did did running away or letting it go ever enter your equation or enter your mind?" And and I thought it was very telling when I thought when I said no, I said no, and I go, I didn't think you would put an obstacle in front of me that we couldn't defeat. And then uh, I'm like, and then I saw how ridiculous that was, right? Because in in every story, in every book, there's something that the character, that the the person can't defeat, and has to either go around it, evade it, or or deal with it differently than head on. Which, you know, I'm stuck in that mode sometimes. And so I ran my games in that way. Everything that the everything I put in front of the player characters, or in front of the characters, I pretty much was sure they could overcome. I never gave them something that was just ridiculously overpowered that they should have never been able to kill. And the plan was for them to run away or not be able to, or run away or do something other than defeat this monster. I've always been this GM that ran games that that the the, that the players could handle it. And even if barely, like I would try to, you know, I, they talk about game balance. I wasn't really into game balance, but I would like, you know, I would kind of do it in my own head. Like, oh, these characters have about this much firepower. This creature is like this powerful. So that was my mindset. And I and I think it was flawed. 
you know, that mindset was flawed for me. And and though I ran great, well, according to my players, I had ran great adventures. I trained them never to back down. So I think it would be disingenuous to try to do that now. Except, you know, I mean, in a fantasy, in a medieval fantasy world. But now, in the, in, when I'm running Shadowrun, I don't think that's been quite the case. Though they've been really good at planning stuff and overcoming obstacles. Uh, I think uh, a couple of times they've actually said, well, let's cut out early and defeat everybody in this place. Cause, yes. Because uh, we may not make it out alive, <laughs> which is good. Shadowrun is a different game than Dungeons & Dragons, too. Yes. Because there's a lot more. You, get, you can get hurt a lot easier. In Dungeons & Dragons, you know, when you when you go down, you have like three death rolls, right? And then oh, you also yeah. have people heal you right then and there. And right. Shadowrun, you know, you have to have... Someone has to have a med skill and different. Med skill, and then they can heal you, but they're not going to do it only once. Yeah. And if, and if they fail, they can actually kill you, hurt you. Yes. And yeah, and so characters a little bit more. What is it? Uh, yeah, they're they're not as powerful, you know, compared to like, you know, D and D where you have a hundred. Not only that, but it, it takes a lot to make a character in Shadowrun, so you're a little more attached to it than D and D. I mean, it takes a lot in D and D too, but. I think Shadowrun is a lot harder. Right. In the character creation department. But the idea that to build in flaws to your character is what you were telling me about. The idea that, that some people actually do a character, pick specific flaws that they want that character to right. have. Right. And I think. I don't I, know why, but. For role playing purposes. I mean, it's like, uh, what is it? Play a game like. I know it's, I'm going way off, but champions, right? There's advantages and disadvantages. Even in uh, in Shadowrun, they have what? Are, not the, what's the? They call them disadvantages. Um, when you get karma? addictions. Well, there's the, uh, that's a specific problem that your character can have, but they call them uh, you know, they got bonuses that that oh that cost. good karma and bad. I mean, there's you you use karma, right? But when you use your karma, sometimes you end up with. Uh, with certain flaws. Right. Is that what they call them? Flaws? I don't know what they call them. But. Well, yeah, but flaws give you karma, right? Yeah. Right. And flaws are like problems your character has. Addiction. But, but how, how – it's really hard to, to figure out. You don't want to have too much. Right. Like because then you, you're just totally useless because you have too many flaws. But in, the, in Shadowrun, there's flaws and there's problems that you can have. I mean, um, drug addiction. Well, the, other than that one, I don't remember any of those. I don't remember either because my Shadowrun character is, is – didn't have very many because I refused to. I was like, well, I might want. I don't think I want to use karma <laughs> in that way. Well, what it does, it gives you more karma to build a. a yes. More, gives you more points to spend el- elsewhere. But that, I mean, that's a game that has built in flaws. Yeah. And most people will take at least one or two because they want that. They give them oh, an extra. It gives me that extra thing so I can do this. So it gives me that cy- cybernetic arm or gives me the special power or gives me the spell or whatever it is. And so there's a lot of games like that. There's a lot of games that, that give you so many build points, character points, whatever you want to call them. And then with those, but those points aren't enough for a lot of people to go, well, I want a little, I want this little extra doodad. And so, well, if you take this, this advantage, you can pay for that one thing you want. Now, how often those disadvantages impact the game you know, lately I haven't really been using them or I haven't been applying them to you guys, but I should. And a good GM will look at those disadvantages and say, oh, so. And then you, you can't blame the DM, right? The GM for using those disadvantages to present story plots and ideas and giving you complications. Uh, and there's other games that do that automatically. I, I don't know. I, I think people will blame the, D, the GM for that. Well, no, you can blame yourself because you're the one that made the character. That said, oh, I have, I have a dependent. That was a big one, like in Champions and Champions and Hero. You know, you would have a dependent. What is that? You know, Mary Sue. You know, Mary Jane. Mary Jane's always getting in trouble, so you got to go save her butt. You know, because you're in love with her. Or you're, you know, whatever. That's what you dang. That's what the GM would do. They would have Mary Jane show up in in the middle of a fight. So you have to go and take her and put, them, put her somewhere where she's safe, which takes you out of the combat, you know, with the big bad guy and stuff like that. And I think that, that story-wise, that works. You know, in comic books, that works perfectly. In, uh, in other games, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to keep track of. It gives you role-playing opportunity. 
and right. gives you story opportunity. I think a lot of games do that now. I think uh, I'm thinking of Fate. They have Fate uses the instead of characteristics, they have these aspects. And aspects, you know, they have a, different examples of different la- different. Uh, I want to say layers, but different levels of of aspect. There's like strong, right? Then there's strong as a bull, and then there's the mightiest, the strongest man who can bend bars and lift gates, right? Or something like that, right? So in fate, they want you to be as descriptive as possible. They don't want lame or 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 simple aspects. They want very descriptive aspects, and the best aspects in the, in their eyes, in the creators of the of fate, the people who wrote it are aspects that can be used against the character as also as a benefit for the character. And so what happens is the GM will, they call it tag an aspect, but it will your aspect could be used against you. And what it does is it gives you a fate chip. And so what, what that does is the chip you can use for, you know, uh, to your advantage in other situations. And so there's this economy, they call it, some people call it anyway, and where your GM and the and the and the players are are exchanging these these chips back and forth, as the GM applies a complication to their story, and then they de- and then they accept it. They de- they, you know, because I think you have to accept it, and then you take it, and then and then later on when it's when it's most beneficial to you, you use that chip to you know be able to do extra whiz bang stuff, and and I think it's it, that's the way it's supposed to work. I've Unfortunately, I have a real tough time running Fate. I don't run it the way it's supposed to be. I think just my old Grognard brain has that difficulty of that tagging aspects and doing all this and that. But I do like the I do like Fate. I do like the way it's it's written. It's just uh, I have a hard time putting my head around it at times with the whole chip economy going back and forth. And there's another game called uh, well, it was called Numenera, but they basically turned it into a system called the cipher system and they and they have a, something similar called a gm intrusion where the gm will intrude on the situation say okay i will give you an experience point if uh if because of the, if you do the, if you're doing this uh you're gonna fall and cause this to happen so the the character the player has the option of taking that experience point to use later and experience points you know you can you can you can use the experience with different ways in Numenera and Cypher, in the Cypher system. You can use it like a instant benefit and toss it and throw it away, or you can keep that experience point and then build your character. Use experience points to build your character to make them tougher or stronger or better. And and the intrusion is a problem that that the GM comes up with because of something that happened in the game, and it just makes it tough. You know, it makes it it make, gives you the puts the characters in a tough situation which you know there's a lot of trust there needs to be a lot of trust in that situation right because you have to trust that the gm isn't out to get you right he's not trying to kill your character he's just trying to present a problem and problems are what game sessions are all about remember when we played in that <clears throat> star trek game at Kubicon? pacificon and we went to a planet i think it, i don't know i don't know if it was vulcan or another planet and when we rolled, you rolled two dice, and one of them was your roll, and one of them was to see if you, or there was a, t- I don't know, a table or something, but there could be a complication. You made it, but there was a complication. Okay. No, I don't remember that. It was the one with the lady that you know. I can't remember anybody's name. They, oh, is that the one that the with the two tables? Yes. And they had the green yes, yes. I don't remember exactly what the system was, but I do remember rolling multiple dice at the same time. And so if you got a complication, you could do what you wanted to do, or if you got, but if you got more than one complication, and th- you usually had to come up with what the complication was. The GM made you do that. Okay, yes. Yeah, you're right. I remember that. So that's kind of like the cipher system. Cipher system could be that way too. Like, you, you know, uh, a lot of games now, they're trying to unload the burden of the GM who is constantly having to come up with stuff. For example, uh, what is it? I don't know what they call it, but the the, the new and now I think the almost defunct uh, Star Wars system that uses those funky dice, They're, they have this, this situation where you can succeed and 
and have a, a succeed and still have a complication or you can fail and have something good happen and in that game usually everything you know they say you know the gm can come up with you know for and i've used this example on 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 our podcast about where han solo charges the stormtroopers right he's like they're they're on the death star and it's toward the end of the movie and you know he goes wild and he's yelling down ah, with his gun not even shooting and he's chasing like what five or six stormtroopers and and they run away because he's, he's literally this crazy man is chasing them so like there must be a whole bunch of them behind him because why would he do this so then he's running so he's successful right he's successful in in doing like a bluff or or whatever you want to call it and chases away the the stormtroopers who were gonna you know m- you know mess up whatever they were doing i think that luke and they were all together or something so he succeeds in scaring away the stormtroopers but in this case he rolled a complication right he rolled a, a bad squiggly line on the funky dice and so at the end of at the end of his success what happens he's chasing him out and he chases him out into the into he turns the, the corner yeah he turns the corner and it's like a bazillion yes. of them and then they all start shooting at him right and so he's so then he's stuck he's stuck with a whole, a whole bunch of people shooting at him a lot of games i think a lot of new games are, are doing that they're they're giving the the dice present a situation where you can succeed and and still have something good happen or fail succeed and have you know and succeed and still have a, a complication something bad happens to your character or the other way around where you fail but then you still have something good happen another example of a game that does that is actually made by that same guy i forget jay little i think is the the creator of that system he created 2d20 system which uses the exact same kind of mechanic but without all the funky dice, which for me, I think it's a lot better. So in this case, you roll two D20s and you're trying to roll under a certain number. But if you roll a 20, that's a complication. So you got to come up with something that, you know, and you could succeed or not succeed. And so there's that simple dynamic where you succeed or don't succeed. You get to do what you want to do or you don't to get to what you want to do. And then there's a, a, there's a chance that you might succeed but then you have this complication. Like, remember, this was the Star Trek Adventures uses that system. Yes. When you guys were trying to go across that log. <laughs> yes. So most of you succeeded, right? Yes. Crossing. But one of you, or maybe two of you, two. Uh, like, you know, you, you got a, you got a I complication. I twisted my ankle. You twisted your ankle as you were coming across. And that, that that was hilarious, right? That that was like, and then then the complication stayed with you. You have a you had a busted ankle, not a busted, a twisted ankle. And so the complication was you moved slower than everybody else, right? Yes. It was not like detrimental. Like your horse didn't die because he failed the roll, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, that little complication to add something to the game that makes it more real, right? Because that does happen in movies. Like, you know, I forget what movie it is, but like, oh, I twisted my ankle. And then now you have to deal with the complication of this person, this character is moving slower than anybody else. And do you leave them behind? Because you're in a rush to get to this to this location, or do you stay with this person, or what do you do? Well, you help them. Okay, well, if you help them, you know, like two people, you know, hang on to the side and walk with them. Okay, that's still going to slow you down. Right? Okay, that's a decision that the group has to make, or the characters have to make, or the players. You know, players man. never leave a person behind. <laughs> the Marines over here. <laughs> the idea is when you, if you're going to make a mini max character, then. You're going to have a certain thing that you're really good at, right? Whatever. When, when you're making that character, that's what you're good at. It's usually combat. Okay, combat. Or whatever, right? Most of the time, minimaxes are combat-oriented games. Isn't there some bard that just wants to be the best singer in the world? Uh, they is might. That like a, is that like a... Yeah, you know, I, I, I honestly, I think mini-maximizers are usually, you know, people who play... Fighters, wizards. Well, I was going to say a specific type of game. A, a, oh. a game where there's a lot of combat, right? Okay. So, you know, whether you play D&D or Pathfinder or, you know, I can't think of another science fiction game. But but that's, you know, you're, that's, Minimaxers are usually known for combat because what happens is it's it's a derogative, right? Oh, you're a mini maximizer or a mini maxer, I think is the term. Well, you're a sub optimal player, then. Oh uh, no, see that doesn't work. Yeah. So a, a mini maxer is, is somebody who's just in it for this combat tactical type of gameplay, and 
role playing takes a back seat where a suboptimal if you want to use that term suboptimal player is in it for the story you know he wants to play out these grand stories and he's going to have that flawed character that that's going to play those flaws and you know he himself or herself the player is going to play those flaws without even being asked by the gm and he you know the player might say oh i'm going to run up and then but i see you know, oh that was a flaw that that he had uh, I'm thinking of, uh, oh my God, anyway. Indiana, Indiana Jones, snakes, right? Yes, yeah. He had this phobia of snakes. And then when they opened that pit, he goes, oh, my God, why did it have to be snakes? So in the in the, in the the movie and in the game, you, you have to overcome this flaw, right? And that's and, and maybe he got negatives for what he didn't seem to have any negatives when he was in that pit. But, you know, to do stuff. You know, because he was sn- worried about the snakes, you know, biting them. So, as a as a character in that, if you were playing in that movie, you would probably get a negative. Oh, I hate snakes! And tell the GM that I hate snakes, or that I have a phobia of snakes. So the GM goes, "Okay, anytime you're near a snake, you get minus two penalty for whatever." whatever right, it is. right. That is suboptimal play, but it makes it for a great story, right? Because if you didn't have the snakes there and you didn't have the phobia. It just wouldn't have been the same. Okay. So I think we need to just change the terminology <laughs> because you shouldn't. So a mini maxer should be called something else. So I understand the term. Um, and all the people who I know who are mini maxers don't consider it a, a derogatory term. Oh, no, no. They consider it well, uh, making mini, the best character possible. Because they're mini maxers. And then the, the people who who call it suboptimal characters should probably you know use a different term <laughs> oh so you're saying you're, you're the terminology <laughs> defines a lot of things the connotations and you're right so in this case you're saying that the the other the person who doesn't play that way is naming it that right we shouldn't use it as a negative term right i gotcha so the person who wants to to play out the role playing and and uh-huh. so i build the optimal character to be the best fighter possible or i build a my character and a lot of people say well why would you build a character with a flaw well because people have flaws right so yeah find a positive term for it well, michael when you listen to this find a positive term well for you could it. say that you know it's a role play rich character there you go or role play rich op- uh, opportunity character i don't know what you'd call it i understand what you're saying so you're saying- my idea is that it, it isn't always about playing the best of something sometimes it's about figuring out how to overcome obstacles because that's what you're doing right you're the whole scenario that you're playing is you have to go find something you have to to find the bad guy you have to figure out why the town has green water instead of blue or who's poisoning whatever or find the princess that was stolen Things like that, right? Those are the. There's always an obstacle in the game that you're trying to figure well, out. I I think it depends on what why you're playing, right? Why are you playing a role playing game? You know, it it's funny. You know, speaking of the mini max uh, uh, trio of of teenage boy, boys, boys and and dad, I've been trying to have more role playing in the game in our games, right? And I haven't. I don't think. I don't know if I've if I've actually said it out loud to them. No. That I want more role playing, but I try to Im- intimate that in my style that I've been trying to Im- uh, use lately by by having more story elements, having more conversations, having more NPC interactions and stuff. And, it, and it's been sort of well received. You know, you and Kathy were really heavy into role playing the last time I ran D and D Fifth Edition, and not so much by the boys, right? And and especially you know the trio, right? But then they play. They're playing White Wolf game. Uh, what is it? There's something about darkness. Uh, stupid thing. I World can't. of darkness. World of darkness. And he's going on and on about his character and all the how flawed his character is. Well, because he's learning. I just, Everybody learns. Okay, it's the same. And they're the all, Shadow but Run, all three of them at the same time. In the Shadowrun game, we've had a whole session where it was all role playing and nobody actually did any. Well, because you guys fighting. were planning. <laughs> and that, they say that happens in Shadowrun. That Shadowrun sessions go one or two ways. They go into the the planning out of everything that they're gonna do, all the investigation stuff, and then there's the battle, right? So there's two games in one. So it satisfies both, both those people. Both, yeah. But 
when there was role playing, there was a whole session where they were going in and and playing, actually. Oh, well, that's right. Doing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And they were you were you were role playing with them the yes, whole time. Yes. Besides training. just the planning out stuff, it that's was right. a whole. That's right. You guys is infiltrating as workers, infiltrating as yeah. security. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was a good session. I, I agree. And I don't, don't you think that's kind of fun? I thought it was, well. They were everybody was really loud that day, so it was a little hard <laughs> for me. But yes, it was. It was a very interesting. It was, it was a very interesting session, and the boys had a lot of fun. It was very loud. It was very loud, and then that, that's my problem with controlling the table. But the boys, but I have a the large boys had a lot of fun. Yes. They had a lot of fun with the role playing aspect. Of okay. It. So I still, I think I stick by my words. I say, depending on what you want out of a role playing game, if you want this tactical, you know, uh, battle thing, which happens in games, you know, almost any role playing game has a combat situ- a combat element to it. And then there's the role playing aspects of it. And I think, I think the best ones are where you integrate those, those two together I know I have to say that I just played in the one ring, which you should have gone to because there was a lot of combat. And But intermixed with that combat, there was a lot of some planning and ideas formulated. And it was amazing, right? Because, like, I think it was uh, Morgan was playing a a dwarf. And so these, these guys had some problems in this tunnels with goblins, and they were humans. And so I go, oh, I know a dwarf. And, you know, they're always digging in mines and stuff, and I'm sure they've dealt with goblins. And so I'm sure that he would have a good idea of how to deal with your current situation. Because so, I was there at the place first, and then and then they, then the, the the rest of my companions show up, and then I go. So here's here's uh, Belly, the the Belli or whatever his name is, uh, the dwarf that I was talking to you about. And Morgan comes out with this fantastic idea, right? I'm just like. And then I turned, I turned to May, who's running the game. I go, I told you he was a brilliant dwarf. Because I was just like in awe of what this plan that he came up with, right? You know, that had to do with bellows making a big old noise of a bow rog, right? And then you, you heat up hot coals. And when you bust through this, this little thin wall where the goblins are digging on the other side, you know, you burst through, oops, you burst through and you throw the coals out and you make this noise and it'll scare the bejeebies out of the goblins thinking that there's a bar rock on the other side. And so they go right away, right? I'm like, and it, you know, the plan sort of worked and, and it sort of didn't work, but it did, for the most part, it did work. And it was just hilarious that, that he came up with this idea off the top of his head. And I was like, man, that's really cool. And I thought that was really brilliant. I mean, you know, he heard me having this conversation before, so I'm sure Morgan's ideas, little wheels were turning in his head. But it was such a good idea and something that, you know, that's what role playing is. You know, when you have these, and it was fun. It was really fun. The session was really well run, but but it was just fun. I was like, and that's the, and that's the kind of stuff that I like about role playing games. When you know, when I run games, I think I've told you this in the past. I've, I've, and I hate, hate repeating myself so much, but you know. I, I went away from having this linear, big, plotted out adventure where players are going to go from A to B to B to C to C to D and all down the, down the line where I envision where they're going to go and how they're going to go and how they're going to get there. And every single time, they would never go in that on, they would never stay on that railroad track. And it was foolish for me to ever think that other people would think what I thought was natural naturally so i've gone forgone that whole planning stage of of a to b section i just i present them with a pr- problem that's all i do i'm a i'm a bastard and give them problems and more problems and more problems and their job is to solve them and when they and let me tell you these people are brilliant those role-playing people are very creative people and and what's amazing to me and, and what really gets me going as a as a gm that really makes me happy is when I have no idea how they're going to solve the situation. And so when the game goes and it goes to the end, I'm being entertained just as much as the players because this is new to me. It really is storytelling. And, and we are we are creating a story together. And I think that really works. And I think that's, I think that's where good role-playing games are. I mean, I remember... I remember games of stuff that happened years ago. I mean, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago now. Probably, no, actually more than that. You know, over 30 years ago. And I don't remember the combats necessarily, but I remember I remember the things that people said. And I remember certain lines that people said because of the spontaneous of it. 
Well, that's most the most hilarious part of, or and I shouldn't say hilarious. The most interesting part of a lot of the even the D and D games with the with the boys is that they the planning of you know Saul says roll your everybody needs to roll initiative and everybody starts talking about well what are we gonna do <laughs> we we know this is coming and we blah 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 and there'll be like a a half hour of just people before they actually roll their initiative unless unless it's a unless, unless it's, it's like press a, for time. Yeah. And and the 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 ideas that people come up with is amazing, right? Just yes, the, and it, it's it's crazy. Some of them are some people go totally crazy off the scale of we could throw somebody this way, or we could build this, or we could do that. And the, I think that that allows people to use their imagination and and come up with these ideas of how to solve a problem, right? And maybe you don't use any of them. Maybe you just end up fighting the people that are coming at right. you, right? But you have that that moment in time where time is suspended because you haven't done anything yet, and everybody's just talking about what they want to do. Right. And it gives and, and or I'll, even 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 if the action is flowing, the stuff that happens in the middle of combat, you know, people will, will people come up with. I think one of them was in your in your in the last D and D game you ran. Somebody was on the roof or somebody something was somebody stuck to the yes, roof. Yes. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. I, I mean, funny, but also memorable, right? Because it was like that's something that d- doesn't usually happen, and they did that because of the situation we were in. Right. And have you thought of something like that? Do you think? No. Yeah, exactly. And it was entertaining to you for you, and then you have to deal with it, and your right. monsters have to deal with that situation, which keeps you on your toes instead of just like, oh, uh, you're sitting back. Okay, he attacks. You attack. No, now you're thinking. I'm going, never sitting back when I'm well. running a combat because <laughs> I have I have to check. It's really it's difficult for me. <laughs> yes. So there you go. If you want to play a a character that is not optimally created, right? Right. I you think should. Most games. Most, most, most games are, are geared to having that happen. Yeah. Except for D and D. And if you need to create the most optimal character, that's okay too. Just remember that if you put lower stats in some things then you know that could be a flaw also well that is definitely a flaw but it may be may not be a flaw you want to deal with right so so think about that when you're right. when you're creating your character so this is gaming perspectives with Saul angeline have a good day mm-hmm.